Good evening, everyone. I would like to call to order this work study session for Independent School District 624. Um, would ask the clerk to please read the roll. Here. Newmaster. Here. Thompson. Here. Arcan. Here. Beloyd. Here. Chapman. Here. Ellison. Here. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll get into our first discussion item: the overview of the conscious discipline. I'll kick it off. Dr. Kazmich. Okay. Thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board. Our strategic plan, Strategy 8, commits to ensuring the social and emotional growth of each student. Now, I'd like to introduce Lisa Oren, Director of Student Support Services, who, along with several others, will provide an overview of conscious discipline, which is one method we have employed as we work to achieve this strategy at the elementary level. Good evening, Chair Mullen, members of the school board. Tonight, I would like to introduce to you three members from our Student Support Services team, Jill uh, Tessman, Kristen Johnson, and Angela Drange. They are gonna to talk to you a little bit about our social emotional learning initiative in our elementary schools. Welcome. Hello, Chair Mullen and members of the school board. Thank you for this opportunity tonight. We're going to be talking about conscious discipline, something that's been going on within the school district. Um, again, thanks for this opportunity to share some of the really great work that has been happening here in White Bear Lake area schools with staff and for children. We are here to highlight conscious discipline. It's, it is an evidence-based, trauma-informed approach to social-emotional learning. Why did we choose to come here and talk to you about conscious discipline and to have it within the district? Conscious discipline is based on current brain research, child development information, and developmentally appropriate practices. It is a brain-based model that has been specifically designed to make changes in the lives of adults first. What we know about trauma in times of high stress is that brains can be significantly impacted. In times of high stress, we operate in our survival brain where safety is paramount. Conscious discipline gives staff tools to be able to identify children's brain state and to move them to the prefrontal cortex, like this slide that you're looking at right now, and get them into the ready-to-learn state. One of our areas on our White Bear Lake strategic plan is around social-emotional learning. Strategy eight of the strategic plan states that we will ensure the social-emotional growth of each student. In order to do this work, we have partnered with other community providers and agencies. We have received funding from the Sauer Foundation and Prairie Care totaling $58,000. This has allowed us to train our White Bear Lake staff, as well as staff from Community Education, Ramsey County Library, Intermediate School District 916, and Solid Ground. Conscious discipline focuses on routines and rituals that are rooted in safety and connection. These routines and rituals can be delivered both virtually and face-to-face. -face. Routines and rituals help build our school families for both our staff and our students. They consist of such things as wish you well boards, kindness trees, social stories, visuals, jobs for all, and much more. Please watch as an early childhood teacher delivers a virtual wish you well routine. And right now I have all of you in the heart except for me because I am the only one that's at school right now. And the rest of you are at home and I hope that you're healthy. So I'm gonna put my hand over my heart and wish you well. I wish you well. I wish you well. All through the day today, I wish you well. I miss you and I hope you guys get to come back to school soon. Conscious discipline began in White Bear Lake in the fall of 2019. The early childhood staff received training and began implementing strategies within their classrooms. 
As a result, the early childhood team saw dramatic improvements in self-regulation, relationships, and problem solving. Conscious discipline training continued in the spring of 2020 through online modules and group discussions. In the spring, 74 paraeducators and 40 licensed staff were trained. This past summer, we trained 79 licensed staff, including principals, teachers, psychologists, social workers, and nurses. Please take a moment to listen to what our Wiper Lake staff have to say about conscious discipline. Greetings, uh, Chair Mellon, school board, Dr. Kazbercheck, and White Bear Lake community. My name is Trevor Putnam. I'm a school psychologist at Birch Lake Elementary. I participated in the conscious discipline training this summer. Was so very much impressed by the framework and guidance that it provided for staff to think differently about behavior. Um, it flips behaviorism on its head in a way, instead of antecedent behavior consequence, it's really about showing compassion and care for students and wishing each other well with strategies and tools to use. Um, I really hope that the district continues to invest in this framework um, for a growing number of staff. Uh, thank you, wishing you all well. The conscious discipline training I took this summer gave me so many new tools and I'm really excited to use them with my students. Conscious discipline really helps educators make that shift from a fixed mindset of do as I say, not as I do, to a more transitional mindset of be the change you want to see in the world. Conscious discipline isn't just another curriculum that I have to add to my classroom on top of the other things that I'm doing. Rather, I will just be able to use it in everyday teaching by how I choose to respond, nurture, and make meaningful connections with my students. I learned how self-regulation is one of the top predictors of life success, and is, this is even more important in early academics. So working with a younger population of students with a variety of abilities, the conscious discipline training helped to guide me through the different brain states and how to support my student's skill set in each of those areas. So I'm walking away from this training with so many resources, including the I wish you well routine to use during my group time, a variety of breathing exercises that I can incorporate into my calming corner, and a script to ensure that all staff can easily implement a positive approach to behavior. I'm really excited to get going this fall and very fortunate that I was able to take this training. Hi, this is Jonathan Lucknick, principal at Birch Lake Elementary. To me, the most important takeaway from conscious discipline is that to work effectively with the students, we really have to work on ourselves as adults first. Uh, we need to understand why we're reacting the way we do to students in different situations and to become conscious of that and to know why we're reacting the way we do and to know that those are the most effective and caring kind of reactions that we could have. And from that standpoint, uh, the journey and learning with conscious discipline is really a journey of discovering yourself and reflecting on your own experiences and how it plays into how you do your job every day as well as uh, how you go about your relationships and every other aspect of your life. Uh, so that was a big surprise to me. Um, I definitely expected to learn something about working with kids. However, uh, conscious discipline was really a journey of learning more about myself and then understanding how that impacted my work. I'm ever so grateful to have that opportunity and I hope we can continue to offer that around our district. I think it would be a great benefit. Thank you.
We all know that COVID-19 is not a short-term stressor. It is a time when everyone is feeling unsafe and disconnected. This is a long-term event with long-term consequences for us, our families, and our community. The more we can do to provide safety to our staff and students by giving them strategies to build composure into their daily practice and manage their emotions now, the stronger their foundation will be for handling stress. As a result, we will all be better able to model healthy emotional regulation for children and increase resiliency. Conscious discipline is based on and steeped in inclusion because we are all in this together. It seems ironic that a virus that requires physical distancing to slow its spread and has drawn our attention to how intimately connected we truly are as friends, neighbors, and communities. Safety, connection, and problem solving are the most valuable contributions we can offer to our colleagues and our students as we navigate these unprecedented times. <clears throat> We know that humankind is genetically wired to seek out connection and contribute to each other's well-being. There has never been a greater need for connection and safety in our schools. Conscious Discipline has helped our staff to shift their perspective of this pandemic from an unprecedented threat to an unprecedented opportunity to build unity, compassion, and connection. When we contribute to others' well-being, we create a sense of well-being in ourselves. As students and staff return back to school this fall, we must remember, like this iceberg you're looking at in this PowerPoint, we will not see what lies beneath the surface. We must consciously notice what our staff and students may be feeling. Am I safe? Am I loved? Am I capable? Do I belong? Am I respected? Am I understood? Do I matter? We look forward to continuing our work and training of conscious discipline. We are excited to grow the knowledge of conscious discipline within the Wiper Lake School District. Angela, Jill, and I would like to wish you well, and we would like to take this opportunity for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions relating to conscious discipline? Ms. Boy. Um, where did we find this particular discipline as opposed to maybe some of the others are out there? Where did we find it and why did we choose this one? Um, well, Kristen and I were colleagues in a, a former school district and um, Kristen actually introduced it to me probably four or five years ago. Um, I wrote a grant through the Sauer Foundation um, about a year and a half ago and introduced it to our early childhood program last year. Um, we saw immediate results um, and wanted to um, bring that into the elementary schools because we such, saw such positive things happening um, with our youngest learners. Uh, Kristen and um, Jill joined our team this past year and Kristen has also introduced it into another district in the state um, and it became very popular in the elementary school, and so we all joined together and um, really um, put our heads together to, to uh, get another grant um, through the Prairie Care Grant um, so that we could introduce it to all of the elementary buildings. So is it something that just works at the elementary level or is it something at the secondary level as well? It can absolutely work at the secondary. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little. But we're only introducing it at elementary right now? Yeah, we're really focusing right now on um, elementary and um, it really is, conscious discipline isn't just a set curriculum as we talk to. It's more of, and I think Jonathan Lutnick said, said it so wonderfully, it's really um, a philosophy in the adult and um, how an adult can change their behavior to really work with students and make those positive impactful changes. Um, so it works both with students and then within the adult themselves, learning um, how to self-regulate themselves in order to um, better regulate children and students. But yes, we are focusing more on early childhood and elementary um, at this time, but we have had some of our paraprofessionals that have joined in on the training that are secondary. So then is there a tie in with special education with this? Um, 
it, we train both special education and general education. So both. I guess I'm just wondering, well, that answers the question. Thank you. Does it? Okay. I just want to add just one little quick piece to that. Um, when we're looking at social emotional learning, curriculums, frameworks, um, whatever it may be to support our district, it's really important that it's evidence-based as well, in addition to hearing how other school districts are uh, putting them into their system and what the reaction is to that. CASEL is uh, an agency, a group, that has really researched social emotional learning, and it's endorsed. This particular conscious discipline is endorsed by CASEL. So if you're interested in learning more about that, it's C-A-S-E-L. Thank you. Sorry. It looks great. I'm wondering, because I'm most familiar with what's been going on at Otter, and I know they, for the last at least two years, have been using a specific curriculum, and I can't remember the name of it, but how is it blending with things that have been taught? Are they continuing, or are we just, are we gonna change the vocabulary? Yeah, no, this is, um, so the specific curriculum that you're mentioning, again, my name is Jill Tessman, um, is called Second Step, and it's important to us to also look for the alignment between frameworks and, and other curriculums that we might be using. Um, it, Additionally, we're looking at the social emotional learning um, competencies through the state of Minnesota. Both that we are using, both conscious discipline and second step, align very nicely with those competencies through the state. And it's like a layering effect. So as Kristen or Angela mentioned both probably, conscious discipline is not a curriculum. It doesn't give us a second step, um, second state of uh, activities per se, although there's embedded activities, but um, what to do when, it's more of a way of thinking, interacting strategies and tools than a set curriculum. So it's more like we're blending them together. Does that okay, make sense? Okay, so it sounds like a philosophy. Basically. It is definitely a philosophy, yes. Yep. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you all very much for your work. It's uh, great stuff. We really appreciate the update. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our next discussion item, uh, D or excuse me, B2, which is the 2020-21 uh, strategic priorities. Dr. Kasmuschak. All right. Thank you, Chair Mullen. So tonight we're going to provide an update on our priorities for the 2020-2021 school year. As we consider our priorities, these are um, the items that we're focusing on. These will remain. Some of them are um, continuing from prior years, but st uh, strategic plan implementation, our equity plan development, um, fiscal management, given the, the times we're in, we'll, we'll talk more about that throughout the course of the next few months. And then um, also just acknowledging the pandemic response is, a, is an ongoing priority for us. So, but tonight, to start us off, recall that this past July, you affirmed the district's equity commitment statement and four-way equity decision-making protocol. You accepted the results of our equity audit, and you approved our commitment to action in the development of a three- to five-year equity plan. So tonight, we welcome Dr. Marcellus Davis, the Director of Equity and Engagement, and Mr. Sebastian Witherspoon, who's the Executive Director of Equity Alliance Minnesota, to provide an update on the process for the development of that plan. So also tonight, as those two gentlemen are, are coming up, uh, Dr. Allison Gillespie will provide an overview of Invisio, a tool that we are using to track the impl implementation of our strategic plan. So she will follow um, Dr. Davis and Mr. Witherspoon. So at this point, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Davis. Can you not see anything when I do that? Does this bother you? Didn't seem like it. It's okay? Good evening. 
Good evening. <laughs> okay, we'll do that again. <laughs> Good evening. All right, again, my name is Dr. Marcellus Davis, and I'm here with my colleague in the work, Sebastian Witherspoon. And uh, we are pleased to be here today to continue the work that we started uh, years ago Dr. The, uh, under the uh, leadership of Dr. Wayne Kazmachek, as well as Dr. Allison Gillespie. And I want us to think that this is a continuance in the metaphoric race to the work of race equity and educational equity in schools. July 9th, the last time that I was presenting in front of you, we were reporting on the equity audit report. And as we learned some things um, from the people, um, as we aggregated data survey and focus group wise that talked about our district um, and made some recommendations, this is the work and continuance of that day. This work is also in alignment with the strategic plan, goal area five in particular. So I want us to know that this is a scope and sequence, if you will, in the work. This work has been started for multiple years and we are at a point now where we are ready to create an equity action plan so that we can have action and we can have measurement and we can have accountability to creating equity within our system, which also means removing inequities. Are we ready to begin? Again, once again, I am here with my colleague, Dr. Uh, Sebastian Sunabi Witherspoon, who represents the Equity Alliance, Minnesota, who is a partner in our work. We work in tandem with them. They provide professional development. They provide uh, youth student development. And I will let you take the mic. All right, thank you, here Dr. You Davis. So it's a pleasure to be here, superintendent, school board. First off, I'd like to commend you on uh, doing what I think is kind of vanguard in this idea of doing an equity audit. And I like the way uh, the superintendent framed it, the idea of accepting uh, the research and the findings of an equity audit, because often there's a lot of push and pull when people say these things are happening within our district. And so the way to think about, I think, the relationship between an equity audit and an action plan is kind of doing it on the ground now. So you have an organization that came in and shared with you what was happening in your district relative to equity, race equity work. And then we are gonna, with the information that we have, you already have received and recommendations, we're gonna convene some folks together to actually do the work on the ground in Wiper Lake to make sure that all your students are meeting that desired end for the specific graduation rates and the academic attainment and achievement that we would like to see within White Bear Lake schools. So this is kind of the agenda for the night. We wanted to speak to you briefly, and it's not, it's not gonna take a tremendous amount of your time, but there's a purpose. There will be a selection of a team. We'll explain these things, the process. We'll explain the timeline, the outcomes, and then if you have any questions for us that we could entertain as well. So it is important for us to always know that uh, there was a song years ago from my favorite artist. His name is Brian McKnight. He has written the soundtrack for My Wife and I's Love. All right? He had a song and it was called Back at One. And I say this to say that any time that we get astray from our work in the district, we must revisit our mission. And our mission says, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to pronounce it this in a theatrical way and, and capture the spilling, uh, feeling in which it was written. The mission of the White Bear Lake Area School District, the community at the forefront of educational excellence, honoring our legacy and courageously building the future, is to ensure each student realizes their unique talents and abilities and makes meaningful contributions with local and global impact through a vital system distingu distinguished by students who design and create their own future a culture that respects diverse people and ideas, safe nurturing and inspiring experiences, exceptional staff and families committed to student success, abundant and engaged community partners. If any time we get out of alignment, we must revisit our mission and it is our work with the Equity Action Plan which will create our first ever equity plan we are going to make sure that the ideals espoused in this mission statement come to fruition through the creation of this plan. Thank you, Dr. Davis. We're kind of tag teaming, so. Um, and I'm having some trouble 
because of my glasses, so bear with me. I got some fog stuff going on, so bear with me as I try to read. And so like Dr. Davis had aforementioned, this idea of always starting back at one, Brian McKnight happens to be one of my favorite artists as well, doctor. And so we wanna make sure that our work is centered in the strategic plan of Wiper Lake Schools, but we need to also identify what our trajectory is, and so this is our purpose for the work of the action plan. And I'd like to read it to you as well, but I won't be as theatrical. <laughs> in an effort to accelerate our equity initiatives and to try to hold true to our district's mission and vision, our collective goal is to inspire the action that is needed to support our students, families, and staff in achieving educational equity, capital letters, all students. That's all of our goals. We want all of our kids to be successful. We want all of our learners to be successful and reach their greatest, highest intellectual performance. We're not trying to create this kind of idea where we're comparing kids against each other. We just want all kids to reach the greatest level that they can attain individually. So the process that we're gonna use, did I overgo on? I think you may have skipped. Okay, my bad. It's all good. It's okay to share the mic. All right, so I'm just gonna briefly go over the selection process. Number one is gonna be very intentional and very inclusive. Our goal is to make sure geographically we represent the entire difference, or the, or the entire district. We wanna make sure that we are representing from uh, community education all the way to tech learning and making sure we have narratives and racially, culturally diverse narratives and multiple perspectives to help guide this process. This is a community effort to create a racially equitable learning environment that is free of inequities, okay? Uh, we, were, we were even getting down to percentages. We didn't want to have too many administrators. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had staff. We wanted to make sure that we had student voice. We wanted to make sure that we had parent, um, uh, as well as external voices to really capture an entire breadth of the community. So the process for creating an action plan is to define equity. We want to start with the foundation of defining what equity means to our district, our staff, our community, our constituents, so we can move accordingly all on the same page being grounded in what this idea of what does equity mean to us. So what does that mean? We've got to gather uh, community voice, create a foundation statement to guide the action plan. We want to review and align. You've already pretty much done all that, so this idea of this continuation of an action plan coincides with the work that you've done with the audit. So you have the information. Once we convene the team, we'll share that information with the team, and that will kind of get us grounded in our work going forward, the trajectory that we'll go on, and go and doing a deep dive into the findings of that, uh, the equity audit that you all had uh, done last year, completed last year. After that, we identify priorities. So we review the policies and the things that are most pressing to the district. So we're gonna dig in some of those places, and we're not gonna identify all the priorities, I mean all the policies, just the ones that are most appropriate for student success. We wanna share those findings with the community stakeholders and ask and get feedback from that process. We wanna make sure that people are being included, so it's inclusive, it's transparent, and people feel like their voices are being heard. And then we wanna determine what the gaps are. So the audit kinda said, these are our recommendations going forward. The group may look at this information and say, well, those are not our priorities. Those are not the things that we wanna initially focus on. So they'll have an opportunity as a group to identify the priorities of the Wiper Lake schools. And then what is the purpose and possible ways to close and eliminate the gaps? Now that's gonna be the hard part. I think a lot of us can sit here and identify some of the things that are happening with our students in Wiper Lake schools, but we can't specifically say why. And so a lot of it is to do with some prognosticating, but a lot of it is to say, this is where we think is happening, this is why. We're gonna have a really gifted group of folks in that space to help lend their virtuosities to the conversation and identify where the gaps are needed and our attention is needed to eradicate those gaps. And then we'll create an action plan. And then we'll assign some timelines, we'll assign some folks, what we call some equity street folks, to do the work. We have to do the work. And so, we're trying to establish a way and, and a process by which people feel gifted enough, they feel like they're equipped enough, and they feel like they have the capacity to actually do the work of initiating to try to eradicate the gaps that do exist in Wiper Lake schools. And then we want to create realistic SMART goals and measure progress and success. 
I think that's one of the spaces that education as a whole doesn't do well. We put really good things on paper, we say really smart things, we have really smart people in the room, but we often don't assess the work that we're doing so we know what's currently happening. And so there's a word that I don't like to use, but I'm gonna use it for the sake of this conversation. We're gonna do it with fidelity. I think, that's, I think that's used as a euphemism sometimes, but we're gonna do this work with fidelity, and we're gonna make sure that there's people involved that hold our feet to the collective fire, if you will. And just briefly, we really have an expedited timeline with our hopes of implementing and getting our uh, plan uh, started by the year of 21-22. So our timeline starts in October. We're gonna communicate it, communicate it out uh, with potential people who want to be a part of this learning experience by using the methodology of um, application process like we've used consistently used for different committees in november we want to start our first meeting of equity action plan team and then by may we want to be completed with our equity action plan creating our equity plan given that it's uh, unusual circumstances and unusual time that is kind of an ambitious timeline but we're going to do our best to make sure that we meet that end so these are our outcomes Create a working definition of equity. I spoke to that on the, the front end of this presentation. Identify Wiper Lake's equity priorities. What does that mean? It means that we want to make sure that people believe that these are the things that we should be focused on relative to the work of eradicating educational gaps and opportunities for all students and staff and learners. This is not just about students. This is about the community. So we want to, any gap that we have that's a barrier for anybody's success, we want to eradicate those gaps. Allocate resources, there's a lot of ways we can do that. I won't speak to that in detail, but those are decisions that are made by people in places that I'm not positioned in currently. We want to establish alignment of equity initiatives, make sure that people, no matter if they're in HR, no matter if they're in teaching and learning, that there's an alignment, people in the classrooms, people positioned in leadership positions in schools. We have to make sure that everybody knows what we're doing, they're on the same page, and we have a critical mass of folks to make sure the work, the work goes forward. We want to create this action plan that we talked about, including a scope and sequence and recommendations identified in the equity audit. So the equity audit is where we start the work and hopefully that's where we finish the work. So that leaves us to the end of the presentation if you all have any questions for us. Thank you very much. Are there that's any good. questions uh, regarding the strategic plans? Sploid. Um, so I was just wondering, we haven't yet selected the team, correct? No, ma'am. How long do you think it'll take to do that if we're meeting in October? I, 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 I hope that uh, we can finalize everything uh, within the next 30, 40 days. I guess I was also kind of wondering, how do we get the outside voices? Where do we go to, how do we let people know that we're looking for those voices and how, how do we get those voices? Good question. I will work with uh, my cabinet team um, for guidance as it relates to how they've done it in the past and just try to be consistent in with, with what the district has already done and just follow that blueprint. Okay. Um, what were the, the different things that you measured for success in the past? Are they typically the same types of things or is it really just related to each and every you know, district or unit that you're working with, whatever those gaps are, is it really that different or are they really tend to be the same kind of differences and how do you measure that? Did that make you, sense? <laughs> you're gonna have to excuse me, I, th I think I know pieces of the question, but I guess the reality is, is that every school has a, s a certain set of challenges as relates to what gaps exist in their district. The audit, identified the, the audit identified the areas that they thought were the highest areas of concern and that's where the conversation starts. So when you come in and you do an audit, you just say, we look at a whole gamut of things. And it says, these are the areas relative to student outcomes, pedagogy, uh, community input, uh, teaching and learning. The, the areas based on the questions that we asked, this is where we got the lowest amount of response in terms of um, if, it, if it was pro or con. And then I think we, we just, based on what we're gonna do, we're gonna use the results of the audit to start our work but it's internal data that's looked at too. So in terms of student outcomes, what are happening, um, student referrals, um, attendance, things of that nature. So it's, ba it's based on just really this idea of empirical data that says we gotta use data to make our decisions. And then one of the challenges that we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to identify what the root causes are. 
And I think that's some of the challenging work is to say, well, why? Because data is just data. But now we have to contextualize it because there's a story behind it and identify what the cause of the data is and what is it telling us so we can make a, a proper course of action. Does, does that help answer your question? Yeah, I guess um, I was just, I'm thinking of in terms of, you know, objective and subjective, you know, I can ask you the question, how do you feel today? And then six months later, ask you how you feel then. Well, you have or... quantitative and qualitative data. So I think related to what you're saying, it's the idea of the qualitative data is a lot more subjective than the quantitative. And right. so um, we're going to have to kind of tease that apart as we get people who can able, are able to contextualize that data, in terms, especially related to the qualitative, qualitative data. OK. To make it less objective, if she, going back to what you're saying. That's a really good question. OK. Perfect. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Chapman. Could you speak a little more to the, uh, what the equity action team is going to be made up of? I mean, in terms of uh, how many members you're envisioning, or if you've got any idea in mind, and also as far as uh, balance, or, or if there's going to be a balance between external you know, community members versus internal staff and so forth, or, or uh, if it's not going to be quite balanced, just any thoughts that you've got uh, as far as the makeup of that team? Good question. So uh, external members, you mean external community members that may uh, have a business in the community or live in the community. Um, I think that will be a small ratio. But our goal is to make sure we have representation from teachers, staff, students, parents, um, paras, uh, multiple different uh, educators that make up education, no settings, um, so that we have a good cross-pollination uh, from multiple lenses and multiple perspectives. Our goal is, our targeted number is 22. Uh, we don't, I don't think we need 40 people. Um, I don't think we need just 10 people. I think 22 gives us a nice cross-pollination across the district from, from early childhood to tech. We want representation. Is that, is that fair? We, we will also have some yep. student representation, and then we, we have slots identified for the, for the positions that people hold to identify those spots. We just don't have the people yet. Okay. And so um, it's, it's a hard process to try to identify exactly who that will be, because I, I imagine that some people will want to participate, but we won't have enough spots. Right. But with, with the work of the cabinet, they'll, they'll find a process that is the most equitable, if you will, mm -hmm. to make sure all voices are heard. Okay. Getting a little more granular, though, as far as when I said external, I was talking not so much, uh, you know, I was looking outside of these buildings, yep. uh, community members, parents, mm -hmm. um, not businesses, so much, I mean businesses gotcha. too, but, but more in terms of parent, parental involvement um, and, you know, what, what the makeup would be there, so. Yeah. We, we do have a few spaces identified for those folks as well. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. You have parents, um, students, and then external community members. Um, so we wanted to try to make sure we had a good representation. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, thank you. No problem. Other questions. questions, Dr. Newmaster? I'm just thinking kind of along the same lines that Kim is thinking as, as we put this together, and no offense to the cabinet, but they represent a particular archetype. And I'm thinking, how do we really get representation of our, of our whole community, whether it's including elders or specific groups or something that's just outside of school? Because that's also a piece of, that's our kids' lives. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, and I also remember two years ago, April, was it that we spent a day trying to come up with a rough definition of what equity was. Dr. Kazmanchek, do you remember that group? And yep. that had mm -hmm. students and community and maybe yep. about 30 people. I don't think it yeah. was. Yeah, so that, that you know, 20 to 25, maybe a little bit more than that, probably closer to 30 is a typical number for these processes. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, it isn't necessarily, you know, who do I, th as a member of cabin, who do I think should be on it? It might be who do I think might have a good idea of who should be on it? So making, and just being very conscious about decisions we're making about representation, I think that's a more accurate depiction of what, what that conversation would be like. And that, that's, what we've, that's what we've tried to do in the past with, 
groups that have come together for these larger processes. That's what I'm thinking yeah. because we've got people that have experiences that need to be reflected in right. this. And we may tap our cultural liaisons to help us That'd identify people awesome. who might be wonderful representatives, for example. Yeah. Okay. And I think we have a couple of students sitting here tonight who might yeah. have some interest. <laughs> uh, I remember some of the testimonies the kids gave at that yep. earlier equity day um, and read experiences and things they'd written and yep. reflected voice. things maybe other mm -hmm. people had never seen through that lens. The end result of anything we work on is always better when students are involved. That's right. that's a hundred percent for for certain. Okay. I was hoping we'd be real. <laughs> Ms. Ellison, did you have a question? First, I wanted to say thank you uh, for this work. I serve as the liaison to Equity Alliance, and it's been a pleasure to to work with them and get to know Mr. Witherspoon and the staff, and I think they're going to do an excellent job, and um, Dr. Davis or, as well. My question is about implementation. So if we have a plan by May, is it your feeling that it will be a, a gradual implementation over a single school year, or will it be something that is like a one to five year plan? Great question. So. Uh, I think the committee will determine whether it's going to be three, four, or five. Um, um, and, and we were uh, very consistent in saying that we want our action plan to be three to five years. Um, and, and I don't want to uh, dismiss some of the work that has already been mm -hmm. in progress. So part of this equity action plan is really coordinating and aligning some of the efforts that have already come together. And again, like steps, we want to make sure the scope and sequence goes a little deeper from year to year. By the time it sunsets, we should be able to have data that represents there's been growth in our district. Mm -hmm. Inequities have been removed, and um, we're seeing it in student achievement. We're seeing it in recruitment and retention of staff and staff of color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can I, I'm going to add something to that. So to put it in the context of the strategic plan, <clears throat> we will likely be having a strategic plan update this coming summer. We would likely be having a, a, an entirely new process um, two and a half years from now. So if that gives you some idea of, the, of those types of processes. And so this plan would fit within that context. And so that plan would also need to be refreshed as we move forward. So it, even if it's a five-year plan, we would be re revisiting and it wouldn't be stagnant and um, it would be worked into and embedded within that, that larger context. So. Beautiful, Dr. K. It is a fluid document. It is organic, and it will be consistent with the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate Thank you. your time. Is there other? Yep. There so Dr. Gillespie has a brief uh, overview of a tool that we're using. And school board members, you'll, you'll see more and more of this as we go forward. Um, and Allison is going to give a overview. Good evening, Chair Mullen, members of the board. We are entering the start of our third year of our um, current strategic plan, and I'm excited to share about Invisio as we get more sophisticated in sharing our progress on our strategic plan, and eventually we'll be able to have a public dashboard that shows our strategic plan progress. So in our first year, we had some internal communication that was awesome and served its purpose. Last year, you had me on special assignment, and I shared progress, and now we have Invisio. And so Invisio is a strategic planning software that really helps us track progress on each of our action steps, specific results, and strategies. It also has an awesome capability that it can connect where schools have connected to our, our district action steps. It shows um, the owners of those action steps, which would be our cabinet members, which schools um, also identified that as work in their own individual site plans. It will increase our communication around the progress, both internally amongst our stakeholders with staff, with you as school board members, and then externally to our public, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then our reporting features that help support us as cabinet members in monitoring progress and ensuring that we're reporting to uh, Dr. Kazmierczak our progress on the strategic priorities. So I'm going to show some examples. We just had our first round of, of reporting, and we've learned some things, and we'll get better over the next few months before we're ready for the public dashboard. And so I'll show you what it looks like, and then 
we um, each month will we'll do some of these reports with Dr. Kazmierczak so that he can share as he sees fit with the board and then eventually the public dashboard will be ready. So each strategy, our um, cabinet members are, are linked as owners for action steps and so they update each action step that they're assigned to. We identified an, a timeline over five years of when we're working on things when it says completed, it means it's been operationalized and is part of our system now and not something that we um, necessarily have to intentionally think about as new work and it's, it's now considered standard work for us. Some disruption might be that, that um, the fall reopening has delayed something that we originally thought we could make more progress on over the summer. And then on track would be that we, we are where we thought we should be. In this strategy, there was one status that was pending when I printed this report. and so. Wayne will get an overview of each strategy um, and then you can break it down even further. So seeing each strategy and then a specific result and seeing the progress. So for specific result 6.1, a community supported plan for the structure of our schools, we are 98% complete, which we all know we have made significant progress in our strategy around our facilities. And then lastly, we are able to put together summaries around specific results. And so cabinet members update their action steps. I'm able to pull from their action step um, summaries and then create a, a more general summary of some of the highlights of our work. And then Wayne can use that to update you around the progress. And eventually some of that will be outward facing to our community and our staff. And so it'll be a great way to highlight the work that's happening as we make significant progress on our strategic plan. So it has been really exciting for me, as I love our strategic plan and know it very well. My fellow cabinet members are equally getting excited about Invisio. You can see them smiling behind their masks. And um, really, the upcoming work for us is that we will continue to work on our internal reporting and communication monthly. Invisio suggests that we have at least two or three internal amongst us as cabinet with Dr. Kaz Kazmer checks to work out our own glitches before we have a public dashboard that will be launched January of 2021. And so we'll work with Marissa and her department and that public dashboard, Invisio actually works with the city of Maplewood. So if you're curious on what it might look like, you could look at the city of Maplewood. I did not know that when we worked with them, but that dashboard will show our progress and be updated each month as we update um, our progress. So I, we wanted to provide an update on how we'll be communicating and it will allow us, as we think about two and a half years from now, as Dr. Kazmierczak said, we'll have a lot of data to support us as we think about what does that look like as we move into a new strategic plan. Thank you very much. Thank Questions? You. Okay. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Blood, I'm sorry. I don't actually have a question this time. You'll probably like that. I think this is fabulous. This is a great way for us to, I mean, as a board, you know, we're supposed to be evaluating what the superintendent is doing, and part, most of that is how are we achieving our objectives through the strategic plan, and this is a great way for us and the community to see what we're actually doing. It's not, we don't have to guess. So I think this is absolutely fabulous. And this was born out of conversations we had as a group, um, and, I, and I don't want to, I shouldn't say this, but you know, we, we did get derailed a little bit in the timing just with everything that happened starting in March. And so um, the timeline shifted a bit just because of everything else we were focusing on, but now we're back on track. So um, targeting January. So you'll see, more, you'll see more of these types of reports here in the coming weeks from, with, from me. Well, I just think so, it's really common that people come up with you know, an action plan and an equity plan and all those different kinds of things and you never hear the ending of it and what you actually achieved as opposed to what the goals were. So again, love it. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Thank you very much, Dr. Gillespie. We'll now move into our uh, third Item uh, B3, which is the school district elections. Dr. Kazmierczak. All right, thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board. So I'm actually gonna just uh, just read through the memo that was included in the packet, just so if anyone uh, is paying attention to this, they, they would uh, have that context. So um, White Bear Lake Area Schools currently holds its school board elections in the odd year, and we take part in the primary system. So I've prepared information uh, that will help us discuss the possibility of moving to even year elections and to eliminating the primary. So according to the Minnesota School Boards Association, 
299 Minnesota school districts hold elections in the even year, while 33 hold elections in the odd year. In 2002, uh, 172 Minnesota school districts held elections in the even year, and compared to um, 299 now, with 168 in the odd year. After the Help America Vote Act of 2002, many school districts in Minnesota shifted to even year elections due to new technological requirements and the associated costs. Another reason cited by MSBA as a significant reason for the shift was low voter turnout in odd year elections. Since 2010, voter turnout in White Bear Lake area schools elections has ranged from a low of 10% of registered voters in 2015 to a high of 34% in 2019. Nine out of 332 Minnesota school districts take part in the primary system, according to MSBA. Um, uh, again, that data is according to MSBA. White Bear Lake area schools last conducted a primary in 2015, and voter turnout was between one and 2% of registered voters. Uh, according to then Ramsey County elections manager, Joe Mansky, the cost of conducting that primary election was approximately $30,000. White Bear Lake Area Schools is the only school district in Ramsey County that has a school district primary. St. Paul Public Schools discontinued the practice in 2011. So due to the low level of public interest and the cost to conduct a primary election, Mr. Mansky at that time recommended that we consider discontinuing the practice. Okay, so with that, I would invite any, any board members to kick off the conversation. Ms. Ellison. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kazmachak and Chair Mullen. Um, is you, a lot of you probably know I'm a social studies educator, and so civic engagement is really important to me, and um, voter turnout in particular. And I'm also a bit of a voter numbers nerd, so I went to the Secretary of State's website because you can look at the turnout for uh, elections over the last several years. And so I collected some additional data and the good news is, the thing that I think is really exciting about this is we live in an area where there's high voter turnout on the even years. Um, we, we live in an area where on the even years, 2012, the, the rate of voting from registered voters was about 80%, which is enormous. Um, for context, Minnesota has the highest voting rate in the country and we're at about 70% turnout. Um, states that aren't are about 40% turnout. But then if we look at our odd years, it drops significantly. And you know the, the numbers that Dr. Kazmichek quoted, the same thing happened in 2017. 2019 was higher, but I think that was the referendum. Um, and so these numbers to me show that we live in an area that votes, and I would love to see more people in this area voting in school board elections. It's really hard to change voting behavior. Um, and so I think the idea of moving to an even year, as many of our fellow districts have done, would be a way to get more involvement in school board elections. So I, I think that this is a, a, a really good option and the numbers really back it up. That if we want to get people to vote, we kind of have to bring the voting to the patterns that they already show. Other questions, comments? Mr. Chapman. Yeah, I, uh, I also think that this is a good idea. I think uh, to, as Ms. Ellison had mentioned, to get uh, as many people out to the polls as possible, I think is a good thing. Um, unfortunately, you, we on the school board aren't necessarily the the people that uh, are gonna turn out the vote or, or if we're the only ones on the ballot, uh, we're not necessarily gonna be the people that are gonna turn the, the voters out. Um, and so the idea of having uh, the even number of years with the larger elections, um, I think there's gonna be a much uh, better turnout on the school board race as well as the other races that occur those, those even years. As far as the, uh, as far as the primary, I too think that uh, that is something that we need to take a look at abolishing. Uh, when we're talking a $30,000 price tag, uh, that's to me uh, a lot of money. Uh, and especially given the fact that we just recently went 
to the voters and asked them for $326 million. Uh, yeah, it's a drop in the bucket in the whole scheme of things uh, when you're talking 326 million versus 30,000, but yet 30,000 is 30,000. And, and I think uh, we need to be good stewards with the, uh, with the taxpayers' money too. So I'm very much in favor of this, uh, this uh, recommendation. Or, or I guess, I, I'm not sure it's a recommendation, but uh, in favor of moving ahead with abolishing the, uh, the primary and then also shifting to even number of years for the school board elections. Other questions? Dr. Newmaster. If I recall this, this year, the decision was not to have a primary early on and then before we got deep into it, wasn't that the case? There weren't that many people Registered because that's sort it's of it's based role. on the number of people who registered. Right, so we didn't have around. to have a primary. Correct. And we had a discussion about how it honestly makes sense not to have a primary, and I would agree with that. Whether 12 people want to run or three people want to run, it it seems reasonable not to have a primary if it costs that much. And the math of changing the years of when, if you cut a year off or extend a year, I'm not gonna to begin to try to figure that one out. Be interesting to know what other districts did when they transitioned. Typically you extend everyone's term by one year. It's a, it's a resolution MSB provides, it spells it out, you extend the terms by one year to get to the even. And that's how districts made that transfer back in okay. the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Are there questions, comments? Has there been any evidence shown that uh, has indicated what the, dan the down ballot uh, results are when somebody typically, I, I respect the fact, I think all states in the nation go up during even number of years, especially with the presidential election. Um, but not everybody votes all the way down the ballot. They typically would go in and vote for, say, the president or the governor. So the, that top position, is any, has there been any evidence that you've seen that has indicated how that works? How the, how the voter turnout has come, come around? I don't have that, no. Selzen? I didn't slice and dice the data quite like that, but you can, you can extrapolate that from the Secretary of State's office. Um, you can look at, you know, certainly 2012, the, the rate of voting was about 80%. 2014, it was about 60%. So the numbers go down if it's not a presidential election, and then go down even further if it's an odd year. Yep, that's typically the way it kind of works, so definitely around the country. Um, I've had some conversations with the Secretary of State, and he's indicated that um, the voting down ballot is a lot less. I'm not, I mean, there, I do have some concerns over, uh, over the whole kind of process, but I'll just say that, I mean, I, I totally respect what, what's trying to be accomplished of, of creating more turnout. I think personally um, that the school district votes in, in odd years. Um, I think that it kind of puts the school board at the, kind of the top of the ticket, if you will, or the top of the, the ballot conversation, which allows residents to be more in tune for, um, you know, the issues that are they're facing. Um, I think in this last couple, especially this last year, we've had a lot of great concern, or I want to say a lot of paying attention from issues related to school district, um, which I think will in the next election will have, uh, increase the amount of uh, exposure to the election. Um, the typically, you know, when somebody's just going in for president or for senator or state rep, they're putting those, uh, they're punching those numbers and kind of looking accordingly. So I would just caution us to look at, um, you know, how that process works before we make a decision. I think that the more that we can put our um, complete vision and, and show, uh, tell the citizens of the our school district, why we're running and what we're doing. I think as people get, uh, you know, see value in those pieces that they'll continue to want to work through that. Um, as far as extending a year, I don't think I am not supportive of extending any agreement. 
I think that if we're looking at trying to um, manage the election, I think that we should hold the election next year and maybe shorten the term uh, for uh, the board that would get elected next year so that the community doesn't think that we're just extending terms uh, for, um, for just another reason or because there's been a lot of controversy. I don't want to lose the community's trust in that piece, so I would encourage us to look at other methods of uh, implementing if, the, if this board decides that they want to move to an even year. As far as the primary goes, um, I, I can see that we're not, uh, we haven't had a primary in several years uh, and don't think that um, having a primary really makes, you know, for the cost value. I, I would agree with uh, Mr. Chapman. Um, I think the one thing the primary does is offer an opportunity to really get down to the core issues. After the primary, it, it, if there's four candidates on the ballot, it would take it down to eight. Um, typically, we don't have more than eight people running at a time, so I think that's just a mute issue, but um, that's just kind of my thoughts. Can I make one more? Dr. Master? I would agree with the fact that we don't often have a primary, but we did have one the first time I ran, yep. and there were 10 or 11 people and it thinned it down so there's no more than I think two per, it thinned it down to six, I think, or something like that. And not very many people voted. I do agree with the fact that in this election, which is a very unusual one where we're inundated, truly, and I'm a geek about politics, I read absolutely everything, every paper, every day, and um, I don't know how much attention a school board attend, uh, election would have. It had a whole lot more attention in the headlines of the paper, you know, with St. Paul and Minneapolis school board elections previous years when they weren't competing with national candidates. So I don't know. I think it'd be interesting if we really want to push this forward to put a survey out. What do people think? Rather than just do it. Ms. Thompson. Uh, what is it working? Um, I, I guess my first question would be, uh, we could do away with the primary without moving the, to an even year for Correct. school yep. board? Okay. Separate issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, as far as removing the primary that, I mean, it would get a little messy when we had a lot of candidates on the ballot, but, um, I see the cost savings as something that's beneficial and, and would make sense. But as far as the um, moving the election to an even year because there will be more voter turnout, well, there will be more voter turnout, but typically a lot of those people who vote in those election years go in and vote down the ticket either with a, a name has an R next to it, they check the box, they got the D next to it, they check the box, school board members don't have that next to them and a lot of times they won't vote for that part because they don't that's not what they went there to vote for or they will randomly vote and just pick because it's on the ballot and it's something there and so they just check boxes but they don't really pay attention um, i think having elections i am somebody who votes in every single election no matter what uh, that is you know, I feel that is my civic duty and it's important to me. Um, I feel like when we have them in the, in the odd years that don't have that big name ticket on the ballot, people tend to pay more attention to who they're voting for. And the people that go to the ballot on those days are very vested in why they are there to vote. Um, so I don't really see the benefit in changing to an even year election. Um, I do see a benefit in the savings of getting rid of the primary. Um, Cause I don't think there'd be, there's, I mean, I don't know, I'd have to go back through the data. I didn't have time to do that to see how many times we've used a primary or we've had that need, but I would have to think that it's, it's a minimal amount. Um, but otherwise, I don't think just, 
moving it to an even year is going to make people pay more attention to a school board election. That's just my opinion, I guess, on the issue. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Mr. Chapman. Just circling back to uh, something that Dr. Newmaster said, and, and I guess it resonate, resonated with me, is, uh, is looking at the possibility at some point of having a survey of the, uh, of the parents and, uh, and of the community just to see where, where the interest lies, uh, because ultimately it's, it's those people that are or aren't going to vote. Um, and, you know, those are the people that, that are our constituents, the citizenry, and I think it would be a good idea to, you know, to find out, uh, take a, a pulse uh, of that, uh, that citizenry to find out uh, what they're thinking, uh, what their, their preference would be. Um, so I think that's, that's a good idea, actually. Dr. Kazmierczak, is this, uh, this isn't something that needs to be decided at the next board meeting, I assume, I mean, no. because the resolution, I mean, we still would have some time before. Yeah, we have time. Okay. For, both, for both issues, we have time. Ms. Ellison? Yeah, I really appreciate this conversation, and I'm, I'm glad that we do have some time to think about it. And I'm willing to go back and look through the Secretary of State's data, um, because my understanding that the research shows, and I can find things to back this up, that people are more likely to vote all the way down the ticket than they are to show up in an odd year election. So, but I can find the data. I'm happy to do that to, to kind of flesh this out a little bit, um, to kind of get a better sense of what the data shows about our community, because I think that that would be really valuable. Um, these big numbers, I think, are helpful, but we can find a little bit more granular to get at what does our community look like um, and what do the voting patterns look like. So I'm happy to do that. Ms. Floyd. Yeah, I think if, if the point of this is to extend the vote, meaning more people coming in to you know, vote us on the board or not vote us on the board, the more people we have coming in, you know, you can extrapolate that to, well, even if they haven't been paying that many, that much attention to the school board items, there, most people are gonna start looking. You know, most people will take a look at what's, who's running, you know, is the mayor running, who's, who's running, that kind of thing. Um, and I, I guess I don't see, because I was off here, I, yes, we were in the paper, um, but we've had more engagement from the public because of different things that are going on outside of an election for us to be here. So to me, people are going to show up because of what's going on at school. So right now, we've had a bond referendum. We did a levy. Now we've got all the COVID stuff. People are going to show up because people now have opinions on some of this stuff. So whereas everything was kind of going along you know, smoothly for quite a while, we're making a lot of changes. So if we really want to know what the community is thinking, we really need to have as many of the community members come in and vote people onto the board. So to me, the best way to do that is to do it on an even year when those people are going to show up anyway. I mean, people get very apathetic and I think, think the other thing that I was thinking about was people are tired of politics right now and they're sort of tired of all of this and so um, making them come back out again in 2021, 20, I think people are going to be very apathetic about that because they're just, I think people are just tired. doesn't even matter which side you're on. They're just tired of, of any of this. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. But I appreciate the research you did. That's, that's helpful. Jessica. Dr. Newmaster. We could talk about this forever, so I'll keep it short. I do agree with all points because numbers, I like data, but I also know your questionnaire has to be more than a survey monkey to get into why you've got that big number. And I think Angela made a good point. I will have to say there's an occasion or two where I'm looking at a particular commissioner or something, and it's like, I make the decision not to vote if I don't know who they are. 
But I think a lot of people, my, my sister will say, well, a woman, you know. So I, I do think there is a focus when there isn't as much hoo-ha. But this year has been outstandingly full of stuff. So somehow, if there's a questionnaire, ask people if they think issues could be as focused on in an election year that had everything in it. Somehow to just get at that, because I don't think a big number of people filling in the circle necessarily represents thoughtful voting. I, uh, I just want to add too is I think that currently our school district elections align with I know they do with White Bear Lake uh, the city of White Bear Lake but I think they also align with Hugo the city of Hugo I'd be interested to see that information also um, and then any other city and township elections along those lines I believe the White Bear township elections are even years um, but I would ver be very interested to see how they align with the other local elections that go um, on at the same time. Well, I know it doesn't jive with the uh, Hugo mayor because we're voting on it in November. And so then County I, and I don't know how the council works up there. I know that in White Bear it's the mayor and two council and then the other side is the even number of years on the other. So that's how they work in White Bear. So I'd be interested to see on how it works. And then, you know, also I know that uh, for example, I think Birchwood has an election this year. I think, I don't know where Jim Lake is. I'd be interested to see how it aligns with all the cities and townships um, that um, coincide with the district. Other questions, comments? Okay. Dr. Kaznick, I'll turn it back to you if you have anything to close with. Uh, no, I don't. So thank you. I've taken some notes and we'll, we'll move forward with uh, the, we have some research to do. So we'll get to work on that. So thank you. Ms. Beloyd. Sorry, just one last question. So have we, it seems like we kind of all agree on the primary question. Is that something that we can move forward and just do that separately? Like get that out of the way, and then you and move on to the. We certainly, we certainly could do that. Uh, um, I know we're not voting here, but I, I'm sensing a consensus on that at a minimum. So. So I think that be, we could treat that as a separate issue for yeah, sure. Yeah, I Which think we is. can put it on the agenda for the next school board meeting and just bring it up as an action item. Um, I think would be the easiest way because we have time um, to manage that uh, because they're not even going to start thinking about however that turns out for a while. So I think we'd be okay bringing it up on the next um, as an action item. Okay, great. Anything further? Okay, we will move into our next uh, discussion item, which is D, uh, B4, excuse me, the uh, overview, and sorry, my glasses are fogged, of the facilities projects. Mr. Walt. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board. Dr. Kazmierczak, Ms. Adams, and Ms. Tessima. Um, as you know, in spite of the challenges that have faced us over the last six months, the uh, facilities planning projects have continued as planned. At the May 19th school board, our architectural firm, uh, Wold Architects and Engineers, provided an update to the board on the scope of projects as well as the timeline that we'd be working on. A lot has happened since uh, that March board meeting. And tonight we've invited uh, Paul Apikowski and Sal Bagley from Mold Architects and Engineers to provide an update of the work. We have several bids that are scheduled uh, to go public very soon, and so now's a good time to do that. So welcome, Paul and Sal. And I know Raj Deidel from MLA Architects, the firm that's worked on the South Campus Gym Project, is here as well, if we have any questions for him. I'll turn it over to you. Good evening, Chair Mullen, uh, Superintendent Kazmierczak, and members of the board. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, I'm supposed to put on a glove here. Um, we are very excited to give you an update on the transportation facility, the Phase 1 elementary schools, as well as the South Campus Gym Edition. Right. 
Uh, we will start with Lincoln and then we'll move into Matoska, Vadness Heights, Willow Lane, the new transportation, and then end with the South Campus Gym and talk about some next steps. And as we dive into those, um, we're in what we're calling phase one of the projects. So um, this is only the first series of ones going out to bid. Uh, the high school, the new elementary school, and the other elementary schools all will come um, to you in various forms and reports in the future. So. So I'll start with Lincoln Elementary School. We'll get into the same rhythm here. Um, I'll talk about project scope and schedule, and then we'll share some exciting developments on the design, including floor plans and 3D renderings, um, and then talk about the construction process. So the project scope at Lincoln Elementary School is to um, have an addition for a new gymnasium, a building conference room, a cooler, and an extended day office and storage space. That will require us to rearrange the parking for that addition. And then as with all other buildings in the district, we are um, renovating the media centers for additional 21st century learning space. And in Lincoln at particular, there is an existing small gym on the north side of the building that will be renovated to serve a new purpose, in this case, um, orchestra and music. And then last but not least, there is proposed to be new classroom and media center furniture, and that is a future project. From a schedule perspective, we were in schematic design working with the core planning group from April to May, and that's the work we reported on uh, last time we were with you in May. Um, we spent the summer doing what we call user groups, getting stakeholder input with the principal and relevant um, uh, space users. Uh, and then the bid opening is coming up for Lincoln. That is on October 13th, 2020. And construction will start, um, act, obviously, after board award for fall 2021 opening. Uh, here are some diagrams. I'm going to start with the diagram on the right is the site plan. So the existing building can be seen in white, and the addition is highlighted in orange. Um, that will include a new loading dock for the building, um, and it also proposes to replace the parking in the front of the building at the bottom of the image um, and improve the building on parent drop-off there. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the main level floor plan. All of the improvements at Lincoln in this phase are on the main level, so we don't have a second floor. Um, but all the areas that are um, highlighted in a color are kind of areas of impact. So you can see the addition really connects the two wings of the buildings with the gym in blue being the centerpiece of that, uh, flexible learning space outside of it, and the light blue with the extended day office and storage in green there. The goldenrod color, if you keep moving east, is the new building level conference room right across the, the way from the learning commons or the renovated media center. We will have a couple zoom in plans on the next couple slides. Um, the existing stage will be renovated into a multi-purpose or flexible lab makerspace. And then, like I mentioned before, the existing small gym way at the top of the image will be renovated to create a dedicated orchestra and music classroom. Classrooms, I should say. And here's what we call an axonometric drawing. So this is like the second floor, the ceiling got taken off so we can look down into the space in 3D. Uh, the center of the image is the gym edition. On these drawings, anything that shows up in the dark black is new and anything that is in gray is existing. So again, you can see where the areas of impact are. Um, the renovated media center just to the right or to the east of that with the building conference room across the hall. Um, extended day office and storage. Uh, there is a new set of restrooms associated with the addition and then improvement, improvements to the kitchen um, with the added freezer and a receiving space. Here we have zoomed into the formerly known as the Media Center, the Learning Commons. So we actually met with um, representatives from teaching, learning, and principals and um, instructional coaches for all the elementary schools to come up with philosophy for the new Learning Commons that can be applied at all the buildings. Um, and it was very important to all of them that there was a um, significant amount of square footage dedicated to collaborative space. So you can see that in what's labeled the Open Media Center, small group tables, individual space, uh, reading nooks, You'll see at all the projects, all of the part, kit of parts is the same, so they all have small group rooms, a new media desk, collaborative space, and space to secure your book collection, although it looks a little different in every building just because of where your um, existing walls are. So you can see that here we have a floor plan as well as one of those axonometric drawings as well. Lincoln's an uh, exciting project. Um, we, at that project, had a little bit more critical mass to work with, with the scale of the addition. Um, and so we're able to um, connect into the building in a different way and correct some um, things that could have been better. So 
Uh, in addition to the gymnasium and the media center renovation, we're also improving the loading dock. And um, I think you'll see in some of these renderings that the cafeteria is going to be a, a nicer space too. We're almost turning that cafeteria a little bit into a commons and it will be another way to sort of orient and circulate in the building. We also look with each one of these projects at how do we make the new design blend in with the existing building. Um, in each case, we have examined the buildings and we've worked with that core group that we assembled to try to come up with a, an answer to that question for each one. I will caution that the colors that are in these um, are a, uh, a good guess at where we're going, but they have not been fully vetted by the, um, the facilities committee or the sites. So there may be some changes in the color as we go forward. Um, in all of these cases with the media center, as you see um, us bring projects across the district forward, we're really looking to turn the media centers into what the district's now calling learning commons um, and take some of the emphasis um, and put it towards small group collaboration and other multifunction things that can't happen or struggle to happen in a regular classroom. So that diagram on the left you'll see happen again and again. We're identifying small group spaces within the each of these um, designs. So that's what the circles represent. The right just starts to show you a little bit of the, um, the floor pattern and coloring that'll go in there, but I think that shows better in the renderings. So. so this is in the main hallway and we're looking at the connection into the new learning commons. So again, uh, you might think of those as media centers, but there's a rebrand going on to be the learning commons. This is kind of at the Northern end of that. So it goes into the circulation desk on the inside there. And now we've just stepped through the, the new main door. You can see that we have a new circulation desk and a conference room there. So that's a theme that you'll see a lot in the design going forward. It's making multi-use spaces um, that help break out and foster small group work. And then as you can see in this case, it's very transparent. So it allows a lot of supervision. It'll give you some privacy and the ability to have some acoustic control for small discussions, but also a lot of supervision. Um, this is another interesting part of the design. As we cut through into the existing hallway to connect the new gym space, what we're doing is actually opening up the end of what is now the end of the, the Media Center Learning Commons. And so this is a view looking back into that space. And then this is a view of that main hallway. So this is a semi-public hallway for events or after school things, but also a great another um, connection that goes between the cafeteria and the rest of the school and then a shot of inside the gym. Again, that's a full-size basketball court. Um, it does not have built-in bleachers, but it's a nice facility and there's a, enough margin around the edge that you can have some um, chairs in that for community events. And then here's a um, preliminary concept for the cafeteria. So this is the Lincoln Cafeteria. Um, we're redoing the mechanical system as part of our improvements. And then on, we're cutting through the wall in a couple of places. So one, what we're looking at on the end wall is where the stage is now. And that's being turned into that multi-purpose room that Sal pointed out. And then on the left, um, those doors go through to the new addition. And so those can be opened. And again, it's going to allow for a lot of different ways to circulate within the building and help um, solve some of the congestion that I think happens in the main hallway. And finally, this is a view from that multi-purpose room looking back out towards the cafeteria. So um, at the elementary level, a multi-purpose or a flex lab um, really can embody a lot of things. You might think of it kind of like an art room, um, it's just a place with a hard surface floor, some access to water and electricity that allows you to do kind of just different things and break out from classroom space. Next, we'll go into Matoska, and you'll see some theme here, as many of the projects have common overlap. Uh, the scope at Matoska is to renovate the media center. We will be creating a freezer, an EL room, an extended day office, and an additional specialist room. And then again, proposed in the future to have new media center and classroom furniture. The schedule for Matoska was very sim similar to Lincoln, so we worked with the core planning group in April and May, brought their guiding principles and criteria to you at our May update. Uh, we did user groups with the site-based planning teams over the summer and into early fall. The bid opening is coming up uh, this week on October 1st. And again, construction starting yet this fall to open in fall of 2021, renovation to happen during summer 2021. Uh, so here's a final plan diagram for Matoska um, to orient you the main entries at the upper left hand side of this and that large volume just to the right of that is the gym that was added there, I believe in 2013. Um, so the color again indicates areas of impact. 
So you can see right when you walk in near the main entry, there are some spaces that are being reconfigured to allow for a true freezer to be added to the building. Um, that will be right across from the kitchen. Um, and then the spaces right next to it will be used for uh, the school psychologist and an extended day office. And then a room across the hall is an extended day storage room. Uh, if we keep going down that hallway and take a right, the learning commons is right at the end of the hallway. Um, so that is being renovated with all the same principles and key tenants that we just talked about at Lincoln, including their own maker space. Um, and then if we go down the main hallway, there's a um, special education space about midway down the hallway. It's a former first grade classroom. Um, so that's a missing space. And then um, you can see on the other side of the hallway, there's a specialist classroom that again is a former first grade classroom. Um, so this group in particular uh, chose when, when the specialist spaces needed to be added, they thought that the square footage that came with those would be best used to create another grade level pod, similar to what you have at fifth grade. So you can see in the blue there, that's a two classroom and flexible space addition so that um, all four classrooms of a given grade can have that same environment. Um, we'll, we'll zoom into that in another slide. And then last but not least, we have some small group and uh, support spaces like a sensory room you can see in green there. Uh, this is just a zoom in of that storage freezer and extended day renovation. Again, gray walls indicate existing walls and black indicate new or impacted spaces. So we've got the freezer, the social worker and psych office, the extended day office and extended day storage. Uh, here are some diagrams of the le renovated lear learning commons at Matoska. So we can see in the 3D is a little bit easier to see. The space does have a small former computer lab at the back. So that will be expanded and renovated to serve as that flexible lab. We've got some small group spaces and storage along the northern part. And then again, the uh, main part of the media center learning commons being dedicated towards that collaborative space. And again, with all of the learning commons, we're looking to try to help create um, flexible space that doesn't pin you in necessarily with hard walls where necessary, um, but does provide some subdivision of space within there. So, and we do that with different design elements. So here's a, um, a view that is looking just as you're walking into the learning commons. So that door will be in the same spot that it is now basically in there. Uh, but we are rebuilding the main circulation desk as you come in, rearranging all of the furniture in there, including the bookshelves, and then adding some new lighting and some ceiling elements that, again, help to define important spaces. So here you can see some, um, we call them clouds, but those ceiling pieces that hang over important spots like the circulation desk. And again, moving farther into the space, um, we are rearranging how those offices are cut into that space now, and it's gonna open up that room and make it a lot more flexible that way. They always get tucked to the side. Um, you can see we have more small group spaces in there to help foster collaboration. Um, and then on the left, you can see we're cutting a new or creating a new opening into um, what is now called the orchestra room, but is gonna be turned into a, a real multi-purpose room going forward. So it becomes again, kind of like a maker space, but will also serve the needs of orchestra and other things within the building. And there's a view inside that room. So again, it's a similar, um, similar set of kind of kit of parts that we had before. Um, some access to water, access to electricity, and flexibility that allows you to do lots of different things in that space. And in the classroom wing, um, this is an interesting story of meeting with stakeholders. So as you remember, at every project, we have a core group that consists of teachers, parents, and administrators um, that help us figure out how best to design the building. So we are meeting all the scope that was promised in the referendum. In this case, they actually, um, as Sal pointed out before, came up with a better idea than we had anticipated before to join together with other classrooms. So in this case, those two first grade classrooms are also getting some openings cut into that flex space. So we end up getting four, pace, four rooms on, a, on kind of a classroom pod where we didn't anticipate that originally. This is a view going into that pod then. So this faces, this door kind of faces um, the fifth grade area that's right behind us on there. So you can see we're creating some features there. Um, this is inside that flex area again. So that, that pod is its own secure zone. Inside there, we create more transparency so that we can foster more collaboration between classrooms. So on the right, you can see that glass that looks into that first classroom and allows them to flow out to that flex space. Another view of that flex area. One other thing you'll notice is there's not a lot of um, locker and, and coat hook space out here. Um, we're creating a locker area near the entry to this zone here, and that allows them to have a lot more flexibility and a lot less clutter in the learning environment. 
and also to flex out of the classrooms and not have to um, be tripping over boots and coats and different things that end up on the floor. And that was Matoska. All right, now we'll move to Vadness Heights. The project scope here, again, Media Center or Learning Commons renovation, um, as well as some renovation to create um, space for extended day and orchestra. We also need to add a freezer at this building and the future new Media Center and classroom furniture and followed essentially the exact same schedule as Lincoln and Matoska. Uh, so here's the plan diagram. This is a split level building, so this is kind of the lower end main level floor. Um, the learning commons is over on the right hand side and then the, on the lower level down by the cafeteria is where we are adding the freezer. Um, it has to take over some existing storage space, so there's actually a, an addition to replace that storage space. We have a couple zoom in diagrams on the next slides. Um, so here you can see the uh, learning commons diagram. So the, um, uh, the entrance to the hallway is shown right here, so that will be opened up. Um, we've got a couple small group and office spaces on both the south side and the north side of varying sizes, um, as well as a, a space for the book collection and um, additional uh, quiet reading zone, and the same collaborative, um, both small and large group space here. And we included those pictures on this slide just um, to remind people a little bit of the flavor of that building. It's got a very bold um, color scheme going on in there, and so we're building on some of that as we do our renovations. This is another um, view of the entry into the learning commons. So in a number of cases, um, the, the sites have chosen to make that entry an opening. So there's not gonna be a door on the learning commons itself. We provide other ways to secure things within there um, when you wanna use that as a community space. But um, the goal is to make it open and inviting and welcome people into that space. Here's a view inside. Um, so this is kind of the main area and we're looking at a number of features around the edge. Towards the left side there, that is the circulation desk. So that'll be rebuilt kind of in the middle of the space to be a hub. Um, on the right side, you can see we have a couple of conference rooms. And again, um, they're, they're flexible. They're meant to be open and, and used for small group collaboration. They do have some glass on there so that'll allow some acoustic control, but also a great deal of visibility. Uh, in the foreground of the picture, you can see what we've done is been able to clear really most of the furniture out of there so that we can just put flexible furniture in that main area. We are also putting cord reels in the ceiling, which are those things that you see hanging down. So there's going to be a lot of flexibility to pull down um, cords and um, use things like glue guns and all that kind of stuff in the center of the space to really turn that into a multi-use space. And then in the background, and we'll show you some close-ups of that, we've kind of concentrated the books back in the corner back there. Um, and also incorporated some small group space in that area. This is a view from inside one of the conference room areas in there. And then this is a view of that book room in the back. So you can see obviously we have all the books fit in there and we're accommodating the full library that each of the schools has. On the far end of that, you can see we started to create a little bit of a small group space. And this is another one where you can see we didn't actually build walls, but by doing softening and lighting, we can kind of subdivide a space in a very flexible way. And there's an example of um, how you can do a little bit, some simple moves can create all of a sudden a group space. So a, a built-in bench and some furniture that can gather around that under a window can make a great little space for collaboration. And then last of the phase one elementary school projects is Willow Lane, but certainly not least. Um, so scope at Willow Lane is a media center renovation, creation of freezer and orchestra space in the proposed future media center and classroom furniture. Um, and the bid opening for this project is on October 8th. So again, coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, here's a final plan diagram for Willow Lane. So the main entry and main office are on the bottom of this image or the south part of the drawing. Um, you can see on the left hand side just off the cafeteria there's some rearrangement happening to create a dedicated freezer um, and some dedicated storage for extended day as well as while well, still accommodating your paper storage. Um, with the main focus of the project being in the learning commons. So that's really at the heart of the school there. Um, the, uh, there's an addition proposed there to um, get it to be of the same square footage and have the same features as all the other buildings. Um, there's a, again a flexible lab that will also serve the needs for orchestra right off the learning commons and a couple small group rooms. We'll zoom in on that. So here we can get a little bit closer. Um, the learning commons here is right off the hallway and the core group there chose to open it up to make that in, as inviting as possible. It's really at the intersection of the um, kind of the common part of the building and the rest of the academic space. 
That orchestra flex room is connected to the rest of the learning commons by an operable wall, so it can flex out and use a larger space, also have subdivision when needed. There's two small group spaces or conference rooms at the back left side. Um, and then again, with a, it having an addition, there will be a significant amount of natural daylight that will come into the space on the north and east corners there. And then here's a zoom in of the um, other scope of the project. So um, taking over a space to create a dedicated freezer and then some rearrangement of actually existing space to be more efficient while still accommodating all of your storage and office needs. And again, with the design concept of this learning commons is to try to create um, flexible multi-use spaces and small group spaces within there. Go ahead. Um, so this is a view looking from the main hallway in. Uh, we are trying to build on, again, the color palette within the building, so we're finding um, colors that are within the building and using those. Uh, again, the renderings don't come out perfect, and actually everybody's screen probably looks like a different color, so if you really want to see the colors, we need to show you some samples, and we can arrange that if the board is interested. Um, but we're using um, that blue color that we find in the building along with some orange that is painted in the hallway to create sort of an archway into that space. This one, again, is intended to be, it is really open. So that space will be open during the school day and allow great flow in and out. Within the space, you can see we're creating a lot of different um, functionality within there. So to the left, um, it's showing that operable wall to the orchestra room open um, so that you can see how that becomes one big space when that happens. When orchestra happens, they can close that wall. Um, in the middle is kind of a breakout space for um, research and um, itinerant staff, so there's a couple computer stations there. And then in the foreground is that multi-use space, which is similar to the multi-use spaces that we've been talking about in the other buildings. Now we've turned to the right just a little bit. You can see we have some of the book collection up there. That, um, that blue space in the middle is the circulation desk, so that's really positioned in the middle of the space so it has a great view of all the things that are going on there. And then as we move out, again, um, we're seeing more of the books space out there, but within that, creating some great little small collaborative spaces um, to make the space multi-flexible, multi-functional. And now we're standing in the corner by the windows we just saw. We have the circulation desk on the left. The orchestra room um, is showing the door closed through the middle of the picture there. And then on the right are some of those conference rooms, again, to create a lot of flexibility. Yeah, we had a long discussion with the group about that. So this is another one of the features that we developed with the core group um, in discussion with them. Um, this plan actually went through a lot of iterations trying to find the best way to help make it multifunctional for them. So the answer to your question is it's pretty darn good. Um, it's not soundproof. And they really felt like um, even with that compromise that was gonna give them a lot better functionality to be able to open that up. All right, now we'll go into the new transportation and maintenance facility, which is recommended for your, um, recommended to award bids tonight. Uh, so the project scope, it's a new facility to support transportation operations, including office space, maintenance space, and bus and I should probably also say van parking. Um, so we worked with the core planning group in April and May and did user groups really over the summer. Um, the bid opening was just a, a few days ago on September 17th. And bidding or construction is intended to start yet this fall and open in July of 2021. Really the critical path for this is to um, try to get those operations off of the North Campus site to allow construction to happen at the high school. Um, and I should just say that's a site plan on the right hand side there. So um, Fenway Boulevard is on the left or the western um, part of the image. Um, buses will come and go from that northern curb cut. There's the staff and um, driver parking on the west side of the side or the left side. Um, we'll show you a floor plan of the building on the next slide, but all of the vehicle and bus parking is towards the back of the site or on the east side, and that will be fully enclosed by a fence. Here's a floor plan of the building. So on the left-hand side is the office space. So you walk into a vestibule and drivers can immediately take a left and go into the driver's room, which really serves as kind of a check-in or lounge space between their routes. Um, or you could keep going straight into the reception and open work area, which has a couple of private offices and a conference room right off of it, as well as um, some storage and electrical closet and bathrooms. I should also say right off the driver's room, there's an area for drivers to use the restroom before they go out for their driving routes. And then there's a door down the middle of the hallway, which really separates office from the maintenance functions. Um, now on this side, we're in the maintenance bay. So there's um, four full um, maintenance bays here. So buses can either drive all the way through or 
um, come and go from either side. There's a receiving area and tire storage. Then there's a space for lockers and a bathroom for the maintenance workers and a custodial closet, an electrical closet, um, a shop area, so doing some uh, maintenance work, some storage, and then last but not least, the compressed lubricants room on the very south or bottom of the page. And then you can see a staircase. It says staircase up to mezzanine. Up in the mezzanine is a mechanical space as well as some additional storage. Um, on the right-hand side, there's a um, couple aspects of the projects that were alternates. So there's an alternate wash bay and its associated mechanical space is the small space to the right of that. And then last but not least, the trash and recycling space. And those are another example of uh, meeting with stakeholders. Um, they were, they're a good idea. They're things that you might want to do in the future, but I believe tonight the recommendation is not to award those alternates, so it wouldn't contain the wash bay. Correct. Um, for a design concept, um, we looked um, for some ways to kind of make this a little bit more interesting building and got a little bit fascinated with the idea of machines and the buses and the work that they do in the building. So we looked at the, the form of the building and, and the pieces that we had to work with. And then also looked at the materials. So we're using a, a fairly economical material, um, precast concrete panels. Um, and that is something uh, the city of Hugo actually has um, a pretty in-depth um, set of guidelines, architectural guidelines for what you can build in this zoning district. So that's one of the materials that works well for that. And then on the right, you can see um, some of the ideas uh, or the pieces of engines and pulleys and gears that are integral to making a bus operate. As we looked at the building then, we looked at a couple of different um, ways to do that. So the part on the front here that looks like brick on there, um, that is the human part of it. Um, it's made to look like a nice, friendly, welcoming building. Um, that's obviously where the office staff is and all the bus drivers will cycle through there during their day. And then on the back side, um, we're using that precast concrete, and you can get a glimpse of it here, applying some of the um, fun patterns and um, forms that we saw in those motor uh, images. Uh, and then this is a view, so this would be um, the view looking out to Fenway or from Fenway. You can see that we're decorating that precast box with some of those fun mechanical things and giving the building a little bit of life so that it doesn't just look like a, a concrete box. And then finally, a view of the new um, reception area. So we've stepped inside and worked um, closely with the district on branding. Um, and this is a little preview of what some of those things might look like going forward. And again, continued that gear theme in there, just again, to tie it into the outside of the building. And then I think Tim and MLA are gonna talk. I think we'll invite Raj up. Maybe while he's coming, any questions so far? All right, questions, Dr. Newmaster. Your mic, Dr. Newmaster. I'm really impressed and things look wonderful. And I'm glad that our plans are moving forward. I was especially pleased to see the expanded media centers in all of the elementary schools. Um, and I just want to note that the American Library Association in 2010 is the group that decided on the name of the learning commons. And that specifically talks about a particular place that we're creating the ability to do all sorts of things. Our strategic action teams, you know, supported this. The board approved the media centers expanding. And I am truly hoping this is the beginning of a new era where we re-institute a strong elementary media program because we're missing that, and it's a specific vi positive variable in achieving an abatement or reducing the gaps, the achievement gap, the opportunity gap, and this looks like a new era. So I'm hoping that we'll fulfill this, that we can utilize some of the state of Minnesota's workshops that they offer to create the team that works in it. And I guess my only question is, as you discussed the group that, that uh, was the team from each school, did you have a media specialist involved from the district? I mean, there are no elementary media specialists now, but yes. did you have someone? Yep, we had some representation from the secondary team as well, as I said, like the teaching and learning, I think Molly Lee, some instructional right, right. coaches, principal reps, and then some media specialists, yes. 
Well, that's good because the book rooms are great, but remember, and I asked this when you presented the last time before this wonderful vision was developed, it's not just books. Even five years ago when I was there, I mean, we had the digitized audio books, which are bigger all the time. You've got all sorts of different formats. So you don't want to just look at static bookshelves. And I know at this time, you said you'd make sure there was display and storage for all kinds of media. And is there a place, lastly, in each so that you can have maybe not a green screen, but some place where you can do um, film work? Yeah, the groups were really invigorated by those ideas too. I think the flexible or maker lab, they all kind of called them different multi-purpose labs were um, one of the main activities they thought of doing in those or those small group rooms as well, which is some of the reason they wanted the ability to have some acoustic privacy. So I'm not exactly sure how they'll do it in each building, but it certainly entered the conversation at all of well, them. Well, and I know in each media center often there are shows, whether it's of student productions or whatever. So hopefully everybody's got a screen of some type now that they've been developed differently it'll come magically out of the ceiling or something yeah and a couple other nods to uh, flexibility and adaptability um, the furniture the bookshelves that you're seeing in there would be all new and they'll be on rollers cool. on wheels so it gives them more flexibility to arrange them and or switch them out in the future if different kinds of media happen or the collection grows just a shrinks. modern book cart yep there and then uh, we didn't point it out much, but you can see it in this one. Um, the conference room back there, kind of in the center of the frame, the wall is green. So in, uh, I think in all cases, they asked for that. So one of the conference rooms has two walls that are green to provide a green screen. Right, for film projects. Super. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Other questions, comments? Mr. Chapman. First off, I want to say that uh, this is very visually pleasing. I mean, I really like the uh, aesthetics of what you've come up with as far as concepts and also functionality. Uh, it seems like uh, just some wonderful ideas. Uh, that said, there, the risk manager in me <laughs> has to wonder a little bit in terms of from a, you know, in this era of school security that we're in um, where we, can be faced with lockdowns and, and uh, unauthorized intruders and that type of thing. Um, I have to wonder in terms of like these learning commons where there's no doors um, and, and like at Willow, there's that one room where it looks like a bank of windows almost from floor to ceiling uh, in a corner there. Um, and I'm just wondering what kind of uh, input that is taking place or what kind of considerations are taking place from a risk standpoint with regard to these, uh, these options and, and uh, uh, ideas that are being put forth. Um, sure, so those are obviously conversations we take very seriously. Um, as we've discussed before, um, Sal and I and much of our office, all we do is schools, K-12 schools. So we certainly understand the, the topic. Um, what we're seeing is um, a little bit of a shift from uh, the idea that a closed box, concrete box is the best place for kids um, and to this idea of more flexibility. Um, however, every single one of these has a lockdown plan. So while you see some glass in some areas, um, that means that in another spot we've provided some hardening so that that area can be secured. Um, in many cases, what we're doing is providing a, a button basically that locks down some doors farther out so that that learning zone or that learning community, we're calling learning studios at the new, at the high school and the new elementary, um, that area is secured unto itself and then it has hiding spots within it. So we're providing um, what we think is um, very similar functionality for lockdown. It just looks a little bit differently um, and it gives you the ability again to have a little bit more open and collaborative environment. I was gonna point out at um, Willow Lane in particular, there's the ability to take advantage of these doors that are, go across the hallway on both levels here. So you can lock off this entire wing, which does allow for um, some more transparency beyond that lockdown zone. So it's really about moving it from being the classroom wall itself to being some other location. So it's really just a, a change in location, it's not a loss. And the core groups did talk about that pretty extensively, um, especially anytime we talk about where to put glass. So it was certainly hotly debated. Okay. Out of curiosity, those like that particular room that I'm talking about at Willow there that has the ceilings from virtually 
floor to ceiling, or windows from floor to ceiling. Um, is there going to be any type of tinting on the outside where you can basically look out from within but not so much from outside in? Anything, any considerations along those lines? Um, For the exterior windows? Correct. Yeah. Good question. We've talked about that at several of the sites. I don't remember exactly the conversation at Willow. Um, that is not something that you have in most of your windows, so right. most of the schools don't have that already. I have not found many districts that look for that functionality to try yeah. to block that. The other thing that's really important to understand is there is no such thing as one-way glass, um, so you can't provide that um, all the time. What really happens is you, you mirror the glass, and whichever side is brighter is the side that you can't see from. Okay. So what happens in the evening then, you either have to draw the blinds or you can see what's going on inside. Sure. So I would say that's not something that we've taken on in this round of projects. Okay. All right. Thank you. Of course. Dr. Newmaster. Just seconding Kim's question about lockdown, because I remember doing that often. And media centers have always been an open place, and I know I had seven doors into the North Campus Media Center, and that was a quick run when we had lockdown. Um, but there are also the fire, uh, I mean the tornado drills and things like that, so I'm assuming every place has a spot that you can squish kids together for our mandatory t tornado drills or whatever. And we've been working with Tim Walden, Kevin Klecker, and your district's hired okay. um, security um, contractor, True North, on kind of collaborating to make sure that those things are happening. And last but not least, as we all think about ventilation, I'm assuming you're blowing through these things and exchanging air like crazy? That um, in the renovated areas, yes, mostly we, have, we do have to upgrade mechanical. Paul mentioned in particular, like at Lincoln, we do have to upgrade the mechanical at the cafeteria as we will disrupt um, where the unit is. Um, in many cases, um, your mechanical at your elementary schools actually was upgraded relatively recently. You guys have been keeping up with maintenance pretty well. Um, so I would say where we are touching it, we are improving it, although you've done a lot of improvements as a district already. Well, I'm just thinking of North Campus. The older North Campus, in, yes, lots of new mechanical North Campus. We'll have a big update for that, um, I would imagine, our next one. But good question. Thank you. It, it all looks great and hopeful. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. Thompson. Uh, yeah, I was very pleased with um, everything you provided and it's very detailed and I appreciated it all. Um, I guess my one question is, uh, these freezers that we're installing in the schools, are they noisy? Um, uh, uh, just for me at, at Matoska, we're putting a freezer um, that'll butt up to where the social worker and the psychology room is. And we just wanna make sure that it wouldn't be something that would be a distraction to whatever services are being provided in that room. I had a question about the, why we were calling them learning commons. So thank you for giving me that information, Marge. Um, but yeah, I did, I did see that and kind of was just wanted to make sure that that wouldn't be anything that would cause a distraction. Sure, yeah, so the noisy part of a freezer or cooler is usually the compressing unit, compressor. Um, so we're actually gonna put those up on the roof instead of where they might typically go, right above the ceiling. So right above the ceiling, they are quite loud, but putting them on the roof should avoid that. And then they are heavily insulated spaces, so um, we should be able to avoid any distraction. I should also say, I can bring up the plan again, but um, in most cases, they actually have a double wall built. So the freezer has its own wall and then another wall right on the other side of it to help with that. Of course. Other questions, comments? Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll we're moving into yeah. To South Campus, the yeah. Sorry, uh, Raj. The gym. Here you go. All right. Yeah, I'll share a little bit about the South Campus gym. That's one project we worked with a different firm on. MLA Architects is a firm that has worked on many White Bear Lake construction projects over the years, and they took on this project for us. Uh, recall that South Campus is uh, going to be occupied by Central or by Sunrise Park Middle School in 2024. And the gym addition is necessary because there's quite a bit more Fayette hours for uh, middle school than there are for high school. So we needed to build the gym. It was part of the referendum. And we decided because we have such a shortage of gym space at the secondary level that we would uh, do this project sooner rather than later. So the gym is facing uh, the stadium. 
And it provides an opportunity for us to create restroom access for the stadium too, is something that uh, any of you who have been to the stadium really will appreciate it. So we'll redo the entrance to the stadium a little bit and that will allow people to flow in and out of this building during uh, evening games to access restrooms. So as you enter the west entrance, it's labeled there. Uh, to your right, where you see the light colored brick is where the restrooms will be. There'll be a gathering space between that and the gym to your left. <clears throat> it's a two station gymnasium uh, and the bids will open for that October 6th. This one did get delayed a little bit because of the new storm shelter uh, requirement. We initially had designed this as a storm shelter and it became really cost prohibitive to put a storm shelter on a gym. And we ended up deciding to, uh, we worked with the city to get permission to schedule that in phase two with the classroom addition to South Campus. That's gonna be bumped up in order for us to get both projects done. So September 2021, the new gym will be available. As you enter the gym, it'll look something like that. The wall to your left as you walk in is the gym and that area that's rounded will have a storage space in there. And to the right are the restrooms. Uh, as I said, it's a two station gym. Um, otherwise a pretty basic gym. It does have windows on the east and the, well, excuse me, on the north and the west side, which will provide some natural light in the space. There are not bleachers in there. Uh, we do have some drawn there, but we're not, we decided not to have bleachers. Once we went to, once we had to downsize the space due to the storm shelter requirement, uh, we took the bleacher project out. So there will be room for, if there's community ed games there on a Saturday, you'll be able to do chairs um, if we ran, uh, we could get temporary movable bleachers we could put on the, on the side for, uh, let's say, a JV or a B squad game. But there won't be bleachers built into the project. Any questions on the South Campus gym? Dr. Yes. Newmaster? Just one real practical one as I'm looking at all of these huge, new, wonderful spaces, and this one is gonna be in action soon, are we supporting our custodians? I mean, they're doing all this extra work, but I'm looking at this with more flowing in and out and more space. Hopefully, we've cloned at least one of the guys down there. Yeah, there will have to be adjustments to cleaning spaces and what's cleaned well. We're gonna have more kids, but we're gonna have a lot more spaces to clean well. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Dr. Arcan, I just have one question. Are you putting in uh, standards for poles so you can put volleyball in there? Uh, I don't recall if we, did we put standards in? We did, okay, yep. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay, thank you all very much. We really appreciate the update. Okay, thank you. We will uh, now move into our first operational item, uh, C1, which is the action on the transportation facility bids. Mr. Wall. Yes, so you just heard some really exciting information about the new projects that are coming. One of our projects uh, recently just went to bid and we uh, closed the bids and, and with us tonight are Jason Peterson uh, and uh, was it Rob Gamelke from Krauss Anderson, who are gonna walk through a summary of the bidding process and then uh, uh, describe uh, what the winning bids are. And then we'll ask for your, our recommendation will be for you to approve the, the bids as recommended. Turn it over to Cross Anderson. Welcome. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, board Chair Mullen, Superintendent Kazmichek, members of the board. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, as we get started on this, we've talked a little bit and you've seen some pictures of the upcoming projects. Uh, we went out to bid and receive bids for one of the six first phase projects. Uh, so tonight we'll be here asking for approval or uh, providing a recommendation to bids to be accepted for the, excuse me, for the transportation building. And in the next two to three weeks, we'll have received bids on the first phase on the balance of the five projects for the first phase um, in here in sequential uh, meetings moving forward. 
So with me is Rob Gumilke. Uh, he'll be the project manager at the transportation building and he can re he'll be reviewing the bids with you today. Good evening. Um, I'm Rob Gilkey, the project manager uh, for the uh, new maintenance facility project. And tonight we are presenting to you a recommendation for award of contracts uh, that we bid out on September 17th. Uh, we received 183 bids for 26 uh, different work scopes. If you do the math, that's about seven bids per work scope, which is very, very good. Um, in my 20 plus years, I've not had that much of a response on a bid project. Um, of the 26 scopes, um, we're recommending award of 25 contracts. We did have one combined low bid. Um, I've, we've reviewed the, the bids with all the low bidders, um, interviewed them personally, and went through their bids to make sure that they had um, all the items in the work scope that was required and that we could recommend their contract for award. So tonight, um, we are recommending uh, 20 five contracts um, and they total five million two hundred forty two thousand six hundred ninety six dollars and eighty one cents uh, this is within the budget for this project and it does include um, alternate number two which adds the diesel exhaust fluid and washer fluid to the compressed fluid distribution system so that is added on to the the project. Excuse me, can you repeat that number, please? It is $5,242,696.81. It's a different number than I have in my packet, so I just want to make sure that the record reflects the correct number. I have $5,242,607.81. Tim, I'm assuming it's the number in the letter. Correct. So we'll modify that recommended action to reflect the number that's in the letter. You got it, Jessica, or do you need him to repeat it? Okay. Is there anything further on the recommendation? Uh, no. You've heard the recommended action. Is there a motion to Approve the recommended action. So moved. A motion by Dr. Newmaster. Is there a second? Second. A second by Ms. Ellison. Any discussion regarding the recommended action? Ms. Thompson? Um, I guess I have a question on a couple of them. And one of my uh, you said that you interviewed them all, so this victory in cleaning uh, one says that they can, and you have faith that they'll be able to fulfill their, they just seem to have their bid was, I mean, I know it's on a smaller number compared to all the other bids, but their percentage and difference to the other bidders on the project was <coughs> much lower. That was a concern of mine as well. I did interview the gal, she is a, uh small business, um, minority um, owned business. Um, I did go through the scope of work with her. She said that she had included all the items. Um, so I, and, and she did say she bid prevailing wage. So I don't know that I can really say that she has, her bid isn't good. Okay, that, that one just kind of stood out to me, the difference. Um, in the amount that they were bidding. And I thought there. And then um, I don't know much about a, a lot of the companies. I researched all of them. Um, 
the Northern Light Steel Fabrication, uh, that company is thought to be, I just, I found some stuff that they had dissolved their company in 2017, so I just wanted to make sure that they would be, you know, I don't know why they dissolved it, it doesn't give you that information, but um, something must have happened and they reopened and they just dropped the ink part of their company name. So I just want to make sure that, you know, they also made you, you know, he's, you interviewed them and they feel yes, that they uh, can. I've done projects with them before um, and they are a good contractor. Okay. We have worked within other districts as well with them since 2017 and have had successful projects with them. Okay. I just, you know, that how I, uh, I'm not sure who the question would go to or if it's something that you guys would answer, if it would be more something than that, maybe Mr. Wald or Dr. Kazmarchek would answer. Um, I have mentioned in the past how I know we always pick the low bidder, and I personally don't think that's always necessarily the right um, decision to make. And in researching the companies that I'll bid on it, we have um, turned down community companies, White Bear Lake companies that are small businesses that work here within our community um, that I would imagine employ people in our district who would have voted for it. We have um, turned down women-owned companies. We've turned down ma and pa shops. You go to their website, they are a small company owned by you know a husband and wife team who live fairly close to our community. Um, Native American woman-owned business, turned down um, a Vadness Heights company that, you know, they, uh, one of them are, you know, T.A. Shifsky's and Son, they were on the high end, a, a lot higher than the other companies, but they are also a very small um, White Bear Lake resident owned business. Um, and I know they have uh, family members who graduated out of our school district. Um, just. I guess more comments than anything uh, as to some of the discussions we've had in the past and, and ensuring that we are, you know, supporting our community members that own businesses here and our mom and pa shops um, that are definitely going to come out higher on the bidding because they are smaller companies. So they, they need to charge more because they don't have that bigger um, business coming in. So it's more of a comment, I guess, just to kind of say that sometimes, you know, the low bidder isn't always, you know, the one who maybe should be awarded the work. And I'm not sure how that process could ever be changed, but it is just uh, something that I was kind of going through all of them. And I was very impressed with the amount of bids that came in for all the projects. That was wonderful to see all of um, the interested companies in the work, but just something I wanted to kind of mention. And, and wanted to just, the Victory One uh, cleaning company was kind of a little mm -hmm. red flag and, you know, her website was, but it is also a smaller, so that you did interview her and you feel confident she can perform the job, that's good to know. Yeah, and I, I will tell you that she, that company did do some cleaning for us down at the Vikings TCO um, Museum and some of the hotel work over there, so. Great. That's there's, good to know. There is some experience with us. That's good. And Ms. everybody Thompson. has to start somewhere, so that is good. So thank you. Ms. Thompson, I also want to say that um, our policy has the lowest responsible bidder, so it's not necessarily always the lowest bidder. It's the, re the responsible bidder, which gives the, the, the flexibility to be able to look at the bids, uh, making sure that they're responsible for uh, the piece. Mm -hmm. And if there's a correction there, Dr. Kazmierczak or Mr. Wald, please make it. But that's my understanding of the policy. Yep, that's correct. Okay. I have, uh, I have Thank some, you. I have some questions. Uh, prevailing wage on all these projects? Correct. And then, and everybody was, is understand that there's prevailing wage? Yes, yes. And in the past, uh, this group has talked about making sure that everybody, um, especially when the vote came up about making sure that everybody understands, the worker understands, that there's prevailing wage so is there a plan to keep record of all the workers that are on site 
Yeah, so we talked about that, I think, at maybe one of the last board meetings about posting the prevailing wage in the job trailers, which we do, um, tracking the number of employees that are on our job site. And then we can request certified payroll as needed or as periodic checks or all checks to make sure that they are paying those people those wages. So those are some of the things that we put in place on other projects that went prevailing wage, opposed to a PLA or an open, open shop. So those provisions will take place for all these projects. So then K will then take over the uh, enforcement of that prevailing wage? Well, as, as your construction, we'll, we'll work with Tim and Wayne to make sure that those are in place. If it comes down to a legal issue, that would come back to your council at that point. But we'll track and monitor and, and make sure that those companies are aware and that they are paying that. As far as disciplinary actions, if they have to get kicked off the site for that, we will work with your, your administration to, put that, to do that. So uh, from my understanding at, uh, that our, at our meeting in April, there was a, a conversation around a vote or a policy that was going to be created for prevailing wage. Has that policy been created? I'm looking at you. A policy? Um, it was my understanding that there was going to be, it was part of the piece on the recommendation for prevailing wage that we were going to have a policy towards prevailing wage. Okay, I don't believe we have a policy for prevailing wage. Po prevailing wage was included in the bid specs, and the yeah. explanation is that it will be enforced. Correct. I, I, we don't have a written policy on prevailing wage. If we need to go back and create such a thing, uh, we can certainly do that. Well, I think we need to have a policy towards enforcement, right? We need to be able to um, indicate that if you do not meet the standard of prevailing wage, that these are the actions that are going to be taken accordingly uh, for that standard. Okay. So you're saying that you'll collect the payroll, you'll collect the uh, information so that, uh, that the board, if indicated that someone has a concern around prevailing wage, that it can be adequately managed um, and that it will be handled as such. Correct. And we've seen things as back pay to contract to employees. It's a range of things that we've seen take place with contractors that haven't or been, or have been brought forward to do it. My only comment was that if it gets to a point where we're going to terminate that contract, we would do, do so with, with communication and with your, with your council. Okay. So can then you tell the board how that process would work? How did, if you how have did, a contractor, you, Jason, excuse me, Mr. Peterson, if there's a contractor that doesn't meet the, that is not meeting prevailing wage, can you tell us how that process is going to work so that we know so it's, it's up front and, and out front? Yeah, so if when we go through the process, once we start receiving um, pay applications and stuff, we'll request certified payroll to ensure that they are paying that. If they're not, that's, I guess I've never had it where they've not, one time they've had to go back and do back pay, but if they refuse to, do, I mean, because of the contract, where the contract is written, they can't really refuse to do it without termination of their contract, which we would work with your council to work through that process of terminating their contract. That language, I, I don't know that I can ex to recite that for you verbatim, but it's a, lengthy, it's, it's a lengthy description in the contract of what that legal action can be if the district decides to terminate those contracts. Okay. Are there any other questions regarding the recommended action? Ms. Ellison. I'm looking back in the, the board meeting minutes and I can provide uh, perhaps some context to the discussion we had about prevailing wage. We, we voted as a board to require prevailing wage, but we did not vote as a board to create a policy. So I would encourage us then to go back and listen to the tapes because I do remember uh, asking something about a policy towards prevailing wage. I believe it came from me, so I would just encourage us to go back and listen to the tapes. I know it was just back here in April, so I'm sure that they're available. I, I would just add too, and I know this, this wasn't asked, but of the contracts that have labor provided within their contract, I think it was roughly 82, 82%. 82 of the contracts that are being approved tonight are to union contractors. Okay. 
this isn't a union non-union no, issue my is issue is more about yep. making sure that the workers are getting prevailing wage and that in that that wage is being enforced that's what my whole issue is yep understood that's that's what i'm just trying to make sure that up front that that information is is there that to make sure that all the workers that come to work on our projects that are getting taxpayer dollars that are getting the prevailing wage for for the county associated with the where the project is so I appreciate you saying that, but the truth is, is that that's what my 100% objective is. Yeah, no, and I wasn't saying anything that other than the fact that the prevailing wage is in line with that, and it's the question usually comes up for those that aren't, if they're if they're paying prevailing wage. So, Ms. Beloit. So just for clarification, so each contract with each one of these bidders has a prevailing wage language in their contract. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments, concerns? Uh, with that, you've heard the recommended action. Uh, this will require a roll call vote. Mullen? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Thompson? Aye. Arcan? Aye. Malloyd? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We will now move to our second uh, operational item, and I apologize because my glasses are fogging. Uh, certification of the 2020 pay 2021 property tax levy. Mr. Walt. Yeah, thank you, Chair Mullen. Each uh, each year, this is a this is an annual agenda item in at the September work session, as we're required to. Um, Certify to the county auditors of Anoka County, Ramsey, and Washington, uh, the district's preliminary levy for the pay for the following years, upcoming years um, taxes. In this case, that's payable in 2021 for the 21-22 school year. Um, <clears throat> again, this is preliminary, and so tonight you're just approving the preliminary, and we ask the or we recommend to the board annually. Uh, to certify the maximum amount, and that allows us to make sure we have it right for the December board meeting in which you'll certify the levy at the truth and taxation hearing. Uh, so tonight, our recommendation to the board is to certify the maximum levy, and we'll continue to work on that and have it for you at the December truth and taxation hearing. Uh, with me tonight is Andy Johnson, our controller, who you met at our last meeting, and Andy can walk through some specific numbers with you. Andy. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Um, I'll have you look at the first page included in the packet. It's a table from Ellers. Um, and it shows the change in the levy. You'll see that the levy um, revenue goes from $55,894,000. Um, that's on line six. That was last year's levy. We're going up to uh, 57 million two hundred and forty three thousand so an increase of approximately 1.4 million in total um, that is a combination of general fund has an increase the community service fund has a very small increase of about thirty seven thousand um, dollars the debt service is the um, largest increase of about 7.4 million that's due to the passage of the bond um, and then there's a decrease in the OPEB levy. If you remember, that fell off with last, um, the last levy. So there's um, kind of an offset there to the debt, to the debt service fund. Um, going into tax impact, the calculation is based on an increase in the referendum market value of about 5.5%, and then an increase in the net, net tax capacity of 6.6%. So what this does is this, this um, impact allows the property tax to be almost flat. So as our property tax base grows, as we have um, higher valued property, the increase in the levy gets spread out over um, more individuals or more property taxpayers. And so the value, uh, the impact actually goes down. So if you look on page two, um, you will see that the tax impact for a $300,000 home, for example, has a uh, decrease of $76 per year. Um, so as long as a house value stays stable, that's, that will be the impact. Now, if their um, home value increases, then um, that will change you know, according to what that value increases. 
So again, as Tim said, the recommended action is that you approve the maximum um, for tonight's meeting, and then we'll have final numbers for you in December. Any questions? Thank you very much. Let's get a motion on the table to approve the action, and then we'll open it up for discussion if that's okay. Thank you. Is there, you've heard the recommended action. Is there a motion to do uh, approve the recommended action? So moved. Um, Scott, I'm sorry, was that you, Ms. Elson? Motion by Ms. Elson, is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Arcan. Uh, any discussion regarding the recommended action? Hearing or seeing none, uh, this will require a roll call vote. Mullen? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Thompson? Aye. Arcan? Aye. Beloyd? Aye. Chapman? Aye. aye. Ellison? Aye. aye. Thank you very much, and the motion passes. Um, we will now move into our next uh, operational item. I believe it's C3 on the revised agenda. Um, and again, please excuse me, my uh, glasses are fogging. Action on the revised 10-year long-term facility maintenance plan. Dr. Walt, excuse me, Mr. Walt. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Mullen. So each year we're required to submit to MDE a board-approved 10-year LTFM plan by July 30th. And at our July board meeting, you acted on that and approved the 10-year plan. It's not unusual for that plan to be adjusted uh, during the fall, and this year we're bringing an adjustment to the board. Um, in that uh, amount may change as the district works to minimize or, or level the impact of property taxes. The 10-year plan that's before you today is very similar to what you've seen. Uh, it includes a pay-as-you-go levy revenue of 6.152 million for fiscal year 22. That's for taxes payable in 2021. Uh, $3 million each in FY 23 and 24, and then an ongoing levy of $3.5 million in years 5 through 10. Uh, the, the documents for the MD submittal are included in the board packet. And so the recommendation is to approve the LTFM adjustment. You've heard the recommended action. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. There's been a motion by Mr. Chapman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Newmaster. Is there any discussion regarding the recommended action? Hearing or, see, hearing or seeing none, uh, this will require a roll call vote. Mullen? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Thompson? Aye. Arcan? Aye. Beloyd? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will move into our uh, last operational item is action on the approval of the property purchase agreements. Mr. Wald, is this you? Or I'll, is I'll, I'll take it and then uh, Mr. Wald can jump in if need be. But so uh, before you tonight is, uh, uh, would be the approval of two properties. One we discussed at length in closed session and then the, the other you received some background information. Again, that aligns with, uh, with the um, other similar properties that we've purchased. And again, these are as we work towards building that comprehensive 9 through 12 high school, these, these uh, properties are on that site. So, so with that, uh, would you prefer that I read the... Well, either you or if your glasses aren't fogging, you can read it. If not, I'll, I will I'll, I'll pull a, mine and... I'll just take mine off and take a crack at it here. All right. Okay, um, move to approve the purchase agreements for the properties described as PID number 143022. 120007 and PID number 1430221300036 located in the city of White Bear Lake, County of Ramsey, State of Minnesota. The board authorizes the superintendent and the assistant superintendent for finance and operations to sign all documents as necessary to acquire said properties. You've heard the recommended action. Is there a motion to uh, adopt the recommended action? So moved. moved. Oh. Got it. Go ahead. <laughs> no. How about a motion from Ms. Thompson, and we'll do a second from Dr. Arcan. Is there any discussion regarding the recommended action? Hearing or seeing none, this will require a roll call vote. Mullen? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Thompson? Aye. Arcan? Aye. Beloyd? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you all very much. Um, with that, uh, unless you have anything else, Dr. Kazmierczak, no. I will uh, move. I will ask for a motion to adjourn.
Chair Mullen, I, I motion to adjourn. There's been a motion. Is there a second? A motion by Dr. Arcan. Is there a second? Second. A second by Mr. Chapman. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We are adjourned.